Okay. And then we just need to do our check to so make sure that it's all up. And then I can, I will sync it into the, if you can be, um, okay. It says meeting is now streaming live. Yes. Okay. So hello everybody. We're just going to do a couple of technical checks. Thank you for joining us. Um, Nadia, if you want to pop into the yoga teachers forum and I'm going to share it in there now, and then you'll be able to see if it's coming up. So if I pop into, uh, shall I do this on my screen or on my phone? I think maybe on your phone is a, is a good place to do it. Then it won't mess up your screen. Facebook. Um, uh, yeah. I'm going into Yoga Teachers Forum. Anyone can join us in the Yoga Teachers Forum. Hmm. Yeah, teachers. One second. Why does it not want to share to the Yoga Teachers Forum today? This is not good. Okay. I'm Everyone in. hold on with me for one minute. I'm in the Yoga Teachers Forum now. Hmm. One second. Rooms, do we need to go into a room? I don't, it's, this is, this is. No, no, no. It should, from here, be able to share into the Yoga Teachers Forum. I don't know why it's not. It worked when I did my talk last week with Gabby. So let's see what's going on. Everyone, welcome. Thank you for joining us. Um, we are just trying to share this in at the moment with the Yoga Teachers Forum. Um, and we are also waiting for some people who registered um, to join us. Let me just see, hold on one minute, if we can do this. Otherwise, I may just share it to your own profile, Nadia. Yeah, okay. Here we go, here it's coming up. Okay. Right. So where are you live? Where are you live now? On the Yoga Teachers Forum? I am live now. One second. I'm just syncing it up. I'm just writing the title and then we will get in. Okay. Check in the Yoga Teachers Forum. You can either be joining us at um, my personal profile or in the Yoga Teachers Forum. I think, Nadia, if you check in the Yoga Teachers Forum, hopefully you will see us there coming in live. Um, oh, there we are. Yay. <laughs> okay. Brilliant. Excellent. So I think we are everywhere we need to be. <laughs> well done. I'm also going to record us so that we will be sharing the recording afterwards. Yeah, a couple of people have uh, um, requested the recording, not able to attend today. Yes. Great. So welcome everyone to um, Birth as a Rite of Passage. Um, if you're joining us in my personal profile, welcome. If you're joining us in the Yoga Teachers Forum, welcome. Nadia will also share this on her personal profile once we are done. And if you pre-registered, then you will get the recording also. Um, and if you have pre-registered and you're joining us, you will have the opportunity to ask us questions as we go through. Um, Nadia, I'm handing it over to you because this really is, I'm just sort of the technical host, but you are the uh, spiritual host of this um, uh -huh. session. So I'm going to hand it over to you and um, we'll be together for about 45 minutes, an hour, something like that. Sounds good. Okay. Wonderful. So welcome everyone. I can't see anyone on my screen because I'm not the host, but I'm, uh, I'm, I'm visualizing all your lovely faces. And uh, if, um, if you have any questions about any of the uh, subjects that we talk about today, maybe you can put them in the chat and then Jacqueline will be able to see them, pick them up. And hopefully perhaps at the end, once we stop the recording, we can even have time for some questions. Um, so let's uh, introduce the subject today, which is birth as rite of passage. It's, it's a subject that immediately piques people's interest. It's why you're here today. And it's why um, lots of people got in touch to say that they were interested in this subject. And, um, 
I suppose many of you here today, again, I'm, I'm unable to see, but I suppose that many of you here today are uh, either yoga teachers, pregnancy yoga teachers, birth facilitators of some kind, or perhaps your mothers who are about to experience uh, childbirth yourself. The reason that I have chosen this subject and the reason that this subject speaks to me is because I have increasingly felt uh, that it's time for community birth workers, yoga teachers, um, birth educators, doulas um, of any kind, those working outside the system uh, to step up a little bit in our offering uh, to support and prepare women for birth as rite of passage. And um, we can talk a little bit about what the rite of passage really is and involves, but suffice to say that currently the, 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 the uh, maternity services model throughout the Western world, in fact, throughout the world is not mother-centered. And Jacqueline and I have just been uh, uh, sharing our total of nine births. <laughs> Jacqueline's had five uh, birth experiences and I've had four and um, they are very different and I'm sure they'll come up and I'm sure those of you who've had your own birth experiences can reflect on how mother-centered they were and how much you were supported in experiencing childbirth as a rite of passage irrespective of whether you have a beautiful physiological birth or a highly medicated um, birth, you're still undergoing some kind of passage from, especially as a first time mother, from maiden to mother, re-emerging in a new role in society. And traditionally and culturally across the globe, uh, transitional phases of our lives, be it puberty, um, be it marriage, be it childbirth, be it death, have been marked by ritual. And those transitions have been accorded the significance that they deserve as the person involved evolves from one state of being to another, one role to another. I think what we just talked about um, before we got on the live was that the focus um, in our culture, especially in Western culture, is on becoming a mother, on the minute that you have the baby and then you become a mother and the focus on sort of the motherhood element of it rather than the transition, the passage from sort of the whole journey of pregnancy and birth and the birthing process itself as something important. Um, for so many of us, we see the birthing process or the pregnancy and birthing process as the means to an end. And the means to an end is now you are a mother. And the mother and the motherhood and being a mother and what that means is the focus, is the end game. But the journey to get there is just sort of, as I said, a means to an end. It doesn't have its own identity. And I think that that's really what we're talking about here today. And, and what you're so passionate about, Nadia, is that the process as its own experience, not as a means to an end of, of something. Yeah, exactly. Um, so in terms of in terms of rite of passage, traditionally, there are three, and maybe it might be useful that we unpack exactly what a rite of passage is. And the, uh, uh, there are known to be, recognized to be three phases. Anthropologists have kind of looked at uh, rituals throughout society and have identi identified three key phases. And those three phases are incorporation, kind of entering, and that phase, entering the process, whatever it is. And we're here talking about childbirth. So uh, what marks that um, process, and I'd be really interested to hear from you, uh, uh, Jacqueline, what your 
experience of that is both culturally and, uh, and, and personally and familiar, familiarly, the, the, the first stage is the separation from society and from life as you know it. And of course, you know, that starts really immediately with pregnancy because suddenly we can't do the things that we did before. We can't go to the pub, we can't drink, we can't do vigorous exercise. Um, you know, we're given guidelines on how to sleep, guidelines on how to have sex or, or not to have sex or in, you know, so there's so much that changes. We have to leave our jobs. Maybe we're gonna go back, maybe we're not. Sometimes we have to move home. Lots of people seem to feel the need to move home. Um, and so that's massive, uh, that's massive personal and social upheaval, even during the state of pregnancy. And then of course that stage continues as you, as you advance in your pregnancy until that last phase, you know, you begin to nest, you don't really go out anymore. You know, you stop going to visit friends who live further away than one mile or so. And then, and then that phase continues into the labor. And let's pause there a moment because I wanna hear from you on how you have experienced that phase. Yeah. So um, I, as you know, I'm a, a yoga for pregnancy and birth uh, teacher, and I also work with women um, on their fertility journey. Um, I'm a hormonal health um, specialist and a women's health um, specialist also. And my training after I trained as a yoga for pregnancy and birth teacher, I also trained in yoga for women's health. So um, sort of this is a lot of the space in which I um live in and I'm quite passionate about. And also being a mum of five kids. Um, and I will also say that in that space of five children, I want to be very transparent. I think it's something that we don't talk about is miscarriage and the journey of miscarriage also. So um, there were also a couple of miscarriages in there, which thank God for me are not traumatic experiences. I know for some women they are. And I think that connects up to a lot of what we are talking about also. Mm. Um, but I only entered the world of yoga for pregnancy and birth following the birth of all my children. And as we've spoken about, I thought I was the know-it-all, you know? I'd done it five times. I'd had a few, you know, different types of birthing experiences. And so I sort of thought, okay, I'll go do this training and I will go do, you know, just to do something different for myself. I sort of will probably know what they're talking about, but I just wanted to do some training for myself to do something a little bit different. So I trained to be a yoga for pregnancy and birth uh, teacher. And as I've mentioned to you, it was a transformative experience because I realized I knew nothing about my body, nothing about being pregnant, nothing about giving birth. I had realized that my whole journey into motherhood, into the next stage of, of uh, life, that transition was a very um, stereotypical, conventional, medicalized, westernized experience where you read all the books, the what to expect when you're expecting genre, that whole field of where you think you are preparing and you're reading everything and you're buying all the things you need to buy and you sort of you know go to mother care and they've got that nice long list and you're going through the checklist and you're reading the books and you're measuring on the app we didn't have apps when my um, eldest was born but you know you're measuring on the different websites of you know how large is your fetus now and is it a raisin and is it a pea and is it a lemon and and you know you go through all of that because that is what the system tells you to do and you looking after yourself and you think you're being very connected but and then you sort of go into the hospital now and home births are much much more common um my eldest is um 19 and so home births were less um sort of familiar and less uh, common during then. So it was really very much, you know, medicalized in the hospital, being monitored, being checked, having the ultrasound. And you think you are doing the right thing and you are doing the right thing, but there is no thought of 
really what is this journey? Because everything is focused on the impending birth and making sure that um, everything goes well. And you are really, um, put your trust in the medical system, in the doctors, in the midwives, in listening to them. And if there is a trauma or an emergency or something that needs to happen, you listen to them, which you should, but there is a very big disconnect between your own needs, empowerment, um, position as the woman who is bringing life into the world and just the, you know, the means to the end of having the baby. Um, and I do always say to the women that I work with, at the end of the day, we want to be empowered. We want to know how to um, feel and experience everything that we're going through with as many tools and as many, as much insight and connection as we possibly can. But there does come a time where that you want to have a healthy baby and a healthy you at the end of it. We just need to try and get there in the best, most empowered, most connected way possible. And, and I think um, the fear, I'm wondering if you want to talk about the fear element of it and the way that um, fear plays an important role in in this whole rite of passage um, because I think there is a lot of fear um, connected for women when when they are just at the mercy of the very um, important medical team that is directing them on this on this rite of passage. Um, so before before we go to fear, I just want to backtrack slightly to, to still be in that phase of incorporation, of coming in, of preparation. Mm -hmm. preparing. And I really uh, <clears throat> enjoyed listening to you kind of go through all the markers of that, of that, you know, that stage of pregnancy. And everything that you kind of went through is external. You know, like you said, the mother care checklist, the, you know, have I packed everything? And it's all... And this is the way that we have been culturally programmed. You yep. know, ready, we get ready on the outside. We live on the outside, but we're yoga teachers. We teach yoga and yoga is inner work. We enter through the body, but ultimately it's about inner transformation and inner evolution. Yeah. This is why, I mean, I, I work as a doula and I, and, and I increasingly... Uh, and I've worked as a doula for the past 13 years. And it actually, I'm at the point now where I'm only going to support women who choose home birth. And that might, uh, and, and I'm really kind of digesting that, but I feel so strongly that, you know, the, 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 the change that's needed is radical that actually, you know, we need to encourage, I do my best now to encourage women to birth at home, um, because it is uh, the system and the whole um, uh, setup, uh, education that we take for granted, that leads you know that leads you to kind of think that preparation is only you know the mother care checklist and um, the baby shower and all the external things. I mean, the baby shower yeah. is a kind of ritual. I, I I've had four. Four, four pregnancies. I've had more pregnancies, but four complete births as well. And uh, when I uh, entered as a as a new mum, actually, you know, I, I had a baby shower, and I remember walking around this ritual event, feeling really kind of uh, disconnected and not uh, not uh, empowered by it um, because it's become so commercialized so commercialized and it was just oh you know it was just all my friends drinking all, all lots of different friends from different walks of life you know drinking champagne and you know bringing me you know bringing me gifts and yes it was lovely and I was very grateful for it but it didn't move in it didn't touch me and yeah. I suppose already I was you know I was a bit on my journey then so that it didn't kind of resonate very much with where I was at but the following three births I had really ritualistic ceremonies where I felt really touched and moved and held by the circle mm. of women that I drew around me. 
and yeah. I hold those events in my heart because they, you know, they 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 were they were beautiful and they were empowering, and they were very much part of that incorporation process. And another, um, I, I was having a conversation with somebody else recently. And I realized through that conversation that again, on that second birth, uh, and then subsequently, I drew around me and I used the, you know, unconsciously, I used the term, you know, I, I had four guides, four strong women, four pillars of support. They were all deeply powerful, spiritual women. And they gave me so much, you know, just in very, and not in dramatic ways, but just through, through that drip feeding of being with people who are really believing in the power, yeah. transformative power of the experience, in the normalcy of the experience, and in your ability to dig deep in order to get through the experience uh, and, what, and what comes out the other side. It's really interesting you mentioned that because um, I want to contrast your experience that you've just expressed with the more um, conventional Western experience um, of maybe the first pregnancy and birthing experience is sort of this potentially this new thing um, that potentially can hold a lot of power, potentially. Obviously, we know that often it doesn't. Um, but the subsequent births, again, very, very much fall um, into um, sort of the shadows because you're busy with prior babies, prior toddlers, prior children, and you're sort of like just your body is changing in some. This is what I've seen um, with uh, women that I teach. And I'm sure you've experienced this this way, but you probably put another language to it, which is I like for us to contrast a little bit is um, with subsequent pregnancies and births, you're more tired, your body is older, you feel the aches and pains more. The journey is often a more negative experience purely because you are you have more to deal with and your head is less focused on, you know, the. Um, the nine month journey that you're on it's sort of like again you know better in than out is what they say you know like at least here I know where it is I know what it's doing when it's when I'm pregnant once it comes out then I'm going to have two or three or four children that I need to deal with and again it's focused on having the baby the pregnancy and the birth is so um not necessarily an empowering experience in subsequent births uh, where it may have been that for the first. So I think the fact that for you, your subsequent births were, and your journey was so much more um, empowering and enriching and connective for you, I think is so fantastic because I think that for many women, it's exactly the opposite. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you want to have another child and you have to go through. And I say that, you know, with, you know, quotation marks, you have to go through the the pregnancy and the birth and you just need to survive it the best way you can. Yeah, um, it's really, and, yeah. Like, carry on Jacqueline, finish what we're gonna no, say. No, 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 I, I just, I, I, I'd like for us to maybe reframe that conversation. Mm, I, I, I hear you and that kind of pragmatic, practical element. And definitely when you're a second time mother, it's a very, different experience and I don't know about you but in my classes the majority of women are first-time mothers or they're second-time mothers who've had a bad birth experience yes I, yes I do believe that in the back of our brains in the back of and the back of our brain is uh you know is the amygdala is the you know this is the primitive birthing this is the, 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 the area that, that, that dominates and runs childbirth. So, and, and it does feel to me that in the back, of, the back of many women's brains, it's an expression, the back of my brain, uh, is this uh, whisper that actually this is not the way it's meant to be. And that whisper is our heritage, our ancestral line. 
reminding us that actually this truly deeply medical model marked by interventions and procedures and disconnect um, uh, is not uh, and a disempowerment for many and for many particularly in the last two years of covid real trauma real trauma this is not the way childbirth is meant to be yeah. uh, um, and, and for me i really had that i really had that kind of like my body's just telling me that I don't want to do it this way. And, uh, you know, my first baby was breached. And, um, you know, coming back to this whole rite of passage uh, uh, model, you know, or, or a way of looking at birth, my baby was breached. And um, there were emotional reasons behind that. You know, I said, let's backtrack because you mentioned fear. There were emotional reasons behind that. Mm -hmm. I've done a lot of research into the emotional side of breach because it fascinates me because it was my journey. And I've really seen that there's some, there's some fascinating research around uh, uh, relationship issues and breach. Mm -hmm. And that was my experience. I had an unplanned pregnancy and there was a lot of vulnerability there. And I had a breach baby and it ended up as a c-section so i was that second time mum he who wanted something different who, who realized who felt that you know there was that this was not the way it was meant to be and what was so wonderful about my second birth was it healed the first fully and completely and yeah. so my particular um uh, my particular journey has been uh, uh, trying to bring in that aspect of uh, the experience and bring it yeah. in through, you know, the healing, the, the support. Yeah, the support. yeah it's, it's funny because I, I agree with you, actually. Many um, of my clients are second time um, pregnant women who had a traumatic first experience because they didn't do any of the um things that maybe they thought they should, or they thought they were doing the right thing let's put that they thought they were doing the right thing for you know a variety of reasons it was a traumatic birthing experience and as you said they want to um they realize that there are other ways to do it and they and the second experience is often a healing process um and that really i think connects up to what you're saying is that it's not that they're having the baby is the healing journey. The birthing experience is the healing journey. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that sort of proves that the birthing experience itself is its own experience. Um, relating up to that fear element, I want us to acknowledge uh, women who arrive at pregnancy after fertility treatment mm -hmm. and the journey that they go on because women who arrive at pregnancy after fertility treatment are already medicalized. Their pregnancy and birth is in a way predetermined because of their journey to get pregnant. And I think that um, there is so much fear in their experience and there is so much um, medicalized intervention in their experience. And I wonder if maybe you can talk about that a little bit, the sort of you know, if there's a way to maybe reframe them or to support them because by definition, their experience is different. Yeah, no, interesting, very interesting. I mean, I, over the years, I have, I, I, I'm always fascinated and intrigued by the stories of each of the women that come to my classes. And because I live and practice in London, I have a lot of women coming to my classes who have uh, come through the fertility route and they are always marked by anxiety. Uh, they don't trust their bodies. Their bodies failed, uh, yep. failed to conceive. So that man yep. your body, it just doesn't work uh, for them. And um, they are uh, often, yes, con you know, controlling you know, feeling the need to kind of have extra, this is, this is generalizations, of course, um, but 
predominantly, you know, they might have extra scans. Uh, they are very vulnerable until the 20 week scan. Once they've had the 20 week scan, they tend to relax much more. Um, and, uh, you know, I wish I could tell you how many go on to uh, conce uh, who, who go on to experience physiological birth, i.e. birth without any kind of intervention. Um, uh, the, um, uh, I am sure the majority will have some kind of intervention, but I do know uh, many women who have gone on to yes. have, once they get past that 20 week scan, again, and it comes back to our community offering. Once they get past that 20 week scan, if the community offering is strong enough, you know, if there is, uh, if there is um, resources for them to really, first of all, get a proper education, um, not just the, uh, not just the uh, proper, by that I mean a full education as to the reality of childbirth, what's gonna happen to them, uh, within the services, what their rights are, uh, you know, what the um, what are the, the the risks associated with so many of these interventions, as well as resourcing them fully and deeply using the vast offerings of yoga. I was saying to Jacqueline before we started, one of my little niggles is that so many women feel the need. To, to supplement yoga classes, pregnancy yoga classes with hypnobirthing, whereas we offer yoga nidra, we offer, I mean, I run, I offer mindfulness as well now as part of my offering because it allies with, you know, the whole approach of yoga. Um, and so uh, we have so much in the yoga tradition to offer these women strength to overcome their fears work through their shadows. If you, you know, I've read up a little bit on the whole kind of uh, rite of passage approach to birth. And often if there are issues that the mother has, it might not just be fear about the birth, it might be fear about yeah, damaging her body. It might be her mother is there and she's stressed about her mother. It might be that she's had an argument with her partner. You know, it, there could be all sorts of issues. And if those yeah. issues are not dealt with, they can prevent the mother from going deeper into the process. Yeah. The emotional life of pregnancy is currently invisible. Yeah. And I also think the emotional life of the birth, as you mentioned, you know, who's in the room there with you? And, um, you know, in uh, some traditions, there are lots of people in the room with you, the mother, the mother-in-law, the auntie, the this, the that, you know, like lots of people there. And yes, if we were birthing in the women's tent, and if that was how, you know, we were familiar with birthing with the women around us who were supportive, then that would be, um, you know, embracing and empowering. But unfortunately, being in a hospital room that may be small, that may have a beeping monitor that you're attached to with all these different people around you and talking and, you know, doctors coming in and checking you and it's not a conducive environment to giving birth today, even though maybe the theory um, of what it, you know, used to be like, maybe um, sort of, you know, heralded back to there, but today it sort of has been a bit warped and twisted. Um, what I wanted to add also is um, the way that yoga can really help is also with the breath work, mm -hmm. the way that we use breath um, during um, contractions, you know, as part of the process, understanding the birthing process. What actually, as you mentioned, what happens to your body? What are the changes that happen to your body? I like to say that um, for the women that I work with, you have been nurturing this baby inside of you for nine months, 10 months. And then you come to the day where you are going to, you know, have your baby. And all of a sudden um, in the hospital setting, you're now passive. You don't play a proactive role. You lie on the bed, you get told what to do, when to do, you've got, you're hooked up to the monitors. You're being checked. You get told when to push. You get, you know, if you've had an epidural, you can't really even feel the progression. And you become this passive player. Um, but really, that is the moment where, you know, 
the curtains rise and it should be your big show. You know, this is the, the you know, the big show on Broadway that you've been waiting for. This is where you show up. And rather than being this proactive, engaged person that understands what's going on in your body, the progress, the changes that you can feel often, you feel, you know, we are obviously disconnected from our contraction journey because we take epidurals and, you know, all other forms of things that we may or may not do to disassociate ourselves with the birthing experience. And we become this passive person. And I always say that, you know, why would you want to become this disempowered, passive person at the moment of truth where this is what the nine months have been leading up to? Um, and I think that changing that narrative and that language, again, whether it be in a hospital room or in at your home or in a, you know, specialized birthing center, um, Again, changing that perspective of the process of rather than you being this passive person that is being instructed and guided what to do by the medical practitioners, that there's a deep, deep connection with what you're going through over that 24 hour, 36 hour period, however long it takes. Social media has been amazing for that. I mean, you know, I, as, a, as a birth worker and yoga teacher, my feed is just full. <laughs> I mean, sometimes I think, oh, for God's sake, it's just <laughs> full of women, you know, empowered giving birth. And it's just incredible. And I think that, you know, if a, if a, if a pregnant woman today wants to, to, to get a different narrative, it's, it, that's the one, one good thing, definitely, that social media has enabled. But what, let's move on to that key phase because you called it the big show, the curtains up. And it's, you know, in the rite of passage model, it's the liminal, it's known as the liminal phase where you are between worlds. And mm. in a physiological birth, it's the, it, it's the gradual letting go into the active phase of labor. And when you're in that phase, Days. if you're you know if you're not on the bed and you haven't had the epidural and you haven't had any medication put into your body of course you have this hormonal matrix rise and as soon as you take anything it's interrupted so it just that's it it's gone but if nothing is put into your body this incredible hormonal matrix arises and um and again of course it's it's really uh, it's super sensitive. So it is marked and interrupted by someone coming into the room, by someone adjusting your uh, monitor, by somebody asking for a VE, by anyone even talking to you if there's too many people in the room and all of that interrupts it. But ultimately active labor in, an, in a physiological birth, the mother is in another world altogether. And she is you know, she has separated from the external world. She is not talking. She behaves differently. We all remember, many of us will have had the experience of suddenly you don't care if you're naked. You don't care if you pooed on the floor or pooed in the pool. You, you, you have no social grace. If you, somebody asks you a question, it's blunt, it's yes or no. And in fact, as women advance deeper into that phase, they start to behave like animals. I wanted to say that. Yes, it's very primal. I remember so clearly, um, and I can't remember for which birth it was, and it may have been for multiple births, um, screaming in pain at the um, at the crowning or as a result of, you know, deep contractions as I was heading into to crowning and birthing. And I remember so clearly the midwife saying to me, don't shout so loud, you're scaring the other women. Terrible. And I was like, but I'm birthing, like, this is what I'm doing. And I could hear the other women from the other rooms also screaming. So I didn't feel that, you know, that it was wrong for me to scream if they were screaming. And how, how, and I know that women are told this the whole time, don't scream so loud, you'll scare the other women, or, or it's bad for you if you scream so loud, or you'll tear if you scream so loud. 
Yeah, yeah. It's terrible. It makes me feel really angry, actually, because, you know, if you're if you're a young first time mom and you've got a senior midwife in a uniform telling you to stop making noise, uh, you know, you take that energy that needs to come out and you swallow it and it goes back into your, you know, you can yeah. you, you, and it goes back into your body and it somatizes and you've been corrected in a moment of absolute empower, empowerment, potential empowerment, you've been yeah. shut down and put back in your box. Yeah. Um, and also absolute um, innate womanhood of, of what it means to birth. And you birth however you want to birth. Like we can guide you, we can help you if you're a yoga teacher, if you're a doula, if you're a birth, a birth educator or supporter. There are ways that you can do it in ways that are really in um, in tune and with your body and ways that nurture you. Um, but at the end of the day, a woman is going to birth however she feels intuitively is right for her to birth. And to be told that what you are doing is inappropriate is um, is the, and even being told by another woman that, you know, by a midwife, by another woman, that what you're doing is inappropriate. You sort of feel, well, if she's telling me this and she's a woman and we're sort of in this together, then I must be doing something wrong. Yeah, yeah. So, of course, and, you know, we know, we know, for example, that the transfer into hospital delays, uh, delays labor. You know, we know that it takes a while for the whole uh, process to pick up again. I mean, after my first hospital birth, I never went back to hospital again. And my, <clears throat> you know, uh, whether you're whether you're alone, and of course, free birthing is a big movement at the moment over here. What about over there for you? In yeah, so I'm based in Israel. Um, and interestingly, what I was talking about having the room full of people is quite a cultural reference here for many people, uh, where there really is a lot of people in the room, which I think is sometimes um, a little bit overwhelming for the woman who is birthing. Um, it is, there is definitely a movement here also to more home births, more intuitive birthing. Um, the biggest movement is the um, zero separation which is once you give birth, you know, to have the baby with you at all times, that's quite a big movement here. But again, that is sort of the end of the journey. Um, it is medicalized, um, but there is much more of a movement into the natural birthing, either natural birthing within the hospital or natural birthing out of the hospital. Um, I think it's, it's, it's happening here equally. Um, I do think though that, um, Culturally here, the focus is on having the baby rather than, you know, as we went back, you know, as we spoke at the very beginning, that this is a means to an end and you are the vessel to bring this about. Um, and I think that the actual rite of passage for the mother herself, for the woman herself is, is less um, talked about here uh, because the birth, and the new creation is such um, a miracle. And that is sort of the miracle. You know, the miracle is focusing on the birth of this being mm. rather than the journey that the mother has gone through. I love that word vessel. I'm just going to pick up on that word because it's, I, I, I love words. So the word vessel is really a wonderful word because it can be used in such different ways. So mm. the way that you've just contextualized it is within this kind of medical model that you are, you know, you are a functional vessel bringing forth the birth of this child and that your experience doesn't really count. <clears throat> and of course now over here, in fact, the World Health Organization, I think, and we have loads of uh, um, uh, uh, organizations over here like Make Birth Better, um, uh, the Positive Birth Movement, and of course they are all um, uh, um, working to, to acknowledge the experience of the mother because birth trauma is huge over here. I'm sure it's huge over there yeah. as well. Whether it's being acknowledged is a different matter, but vessel as well can be the perfect word 
from the spiritual perspective, from the perspective of the yogini, because uh, you are the witness to this incredible process, this birth energy, this powerful energetic movement, which is also physiological, which is also emotional, which is also mental, uh, moving through you. And that is, uh, uh, and, and that is, if you like, that liminal phase where you have immersed yourself, you have aligned yourself so fully and completely with the experience that you are a vessel, mm. a very different kind of vessel. I love that. Different places, aren't they? Yeah, I love that. I love that. I wonder if, if you can talk a little bit, I know you've got a, a workshop coming up, sort of to talk about how we, how you, um, and uh, the things that you do that help to really either change the language, change the conversation, change the experience for women. Mm, okay. Well, I mean, I'll, I'll talk about my, I mean, one of the things that I, that I, that the first thing that I did was create my yoga and mindfulness training because I just felt that the mind, you know, the mind of the mother, uh, well, my own experience at the end of, you probably did the same, Jacqueline, at the end of your fifth birth, you probably processed all of them. You know, you process this huge experience. We're all marked by our births. One lady, she contacted me, she said, my children are 16 and 18 and I'm still marked by the, I feel them like they were yesterday. Ina May Gaskin says, you know, you, a woman uh, remembers her birth for the rest of her life. You know, this stuff counts. Yeah. And also, don't you find it that women love to share birth stories? Of course. Yeah. yeah. And it's really interesting because as you've been talking, I, I'm going to let you talk about your workshop, but I've really been thinking about the fact that we, in a way, if you're having a conventional westernized medicalized um, birthing process, you're very disconnected from it. But in hindsight, you share it with people, but it it's very... Um, it, it, it sort of takes on a life of its own. You sort of realize afterwards that you went through this process, that you went through this journey, that you went through this rite of passage. But unfortunately, you don't realize it when you're in it because, you know, I think often the sharing of the birthing stories and the rehashing of it and the thinking about it and the processing really only happens afterwards when you realize, oh, okay, this was the experience I had you know, whether it was a positive experience or a negative experience or whatever the experience was. Mm, mm. I, you know, the whole birth story uh, situation is huge. There's so much to kind of unpack in there and, you know, not least because our stories change, you know, as we discover more about ourselves, we kind of rewrite our stories, but stories as healing, stories as, um, uh, stories as uh, um, uh, the perpetuation of uh, dysfunctional birth, you know, oh God, yeah. don't do that. Don't do that. That's a terrible idea. I tried to do that and it fails. I mean, often I tell women, you know, you have to protect yourself from the stories of others being put onto you. There's a catharsis, there's a healing. I mean, there's so much there. Yeah, and I'm just going to add one element and I'm going to let you talk because I, as again, I'm just thinking about this now is that the disassociation with it being your journey um, happens even after the process because your children often want to know their birth story. So it's actually not your story anymore. How was I born? And you talk to your children about their birth story which detaches you even more from it being your story, right? I had a friend uh, the other day uh, um, uh, bemoan how she felt like actually her child's birthday should be her birthday as well, because every time the child has the birthday, yeah. they relive, there's a revisiting of that yeah. story. And, you know, whether it's rewritten or re, uh, reimagined, I mean, one of the things as a doula I really notice is that often a woman can feel uh, traumatized or, or confused or 
um, frustrated about an element of her birth experience because she's only got limited knowledge of the wider context of that, you know, of what happened, why it happened. And so often when you, um, uh, you know, when you sit down with someone who perhaps has a deeper understanding of the whole process, they can help you to make sense of your experience. Uh, especially, yeah. you know, I'm not talking so much about the debriefing uh, process that hospitals offer, which is more about protecting the hospital, but with a, you know, with someone who's really there for you. Independently. Yeah. So tell us about your workshop. Yeah. Okay. So, um, so the, 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 the training that I have devised um, is called the maternity chakras. And um, this is a training that is nine weeks long and it's for pregnancy yoga teachers. Um, and uh, it is uh, uh, taking this model of the chakras and the chakras have, have had a really uh, bad press over the last few years. You know, they've been very trivialized, haven't they? With the, the color coding charts and the uh, yep. mantras that are just associated with them. But actually, uh, this body of knowledge and this way of working, the classical body of knowledge coming from the yoga tradition, followed by the Western psychological uh, body of knowledge um, that has uh, been uh, added on top of, and it's an evolution. I feel like it's an evolution as well as an interpretation, but you have got this incredible body of knowledge uh, that is so fully holistic, you know, starting with your root and all the issues that arise around primal safety. And, and, and for example, issues that we've, we've touched on today, like unless a woman feels safe, she can't let go. And so unless a woman feels safe, she can't move in to that second phase. And of course, okay. in hospitals, because we're always on our guard, you know, what's coming next, what's happening next, four hours, you need another VE. How can a woman let go into that liminal phase? Women just aren't experiencing that liminal phase yeah. in, in, in hospital birthing. So, you know, how can we as birth workers, as yoga teachers, really educate our women with the issues of boundaries, uh, your psychological boundaries, your physical boundaries, being touched, vaginal examinations, consent. Nobody has any idea about consent. You know, the midwife says, just hop on the bed. Let me examine you. I think there was a study done recently over the last two, uh, two, uh, two years of COVID where 80% of women uh, felt that they were forced into vaginal examinations. Wow. That's huge. That's huge and deeply disempowering. You know, yeah. In a, in a purely physiological birth, nothing goes up and in. The energy is only down and out. Yeah. So that's just base chakra stuff, you know, and it's the realm of the pelvic floor. It's the realm of the vagina. You know, it's, it mm -hmm. is connected with your primal brain, your primal, uh, birthing brain so there's so much just with one chakra but on this journey we're exploring how each of these centers each of these energy centers and the areas of your body life <clears throat> that they govern the psychological attributes associated with each center um, can be reframed for the maternal experience you know a chakra two sexuality and birth. I'm fascinated by how uh, at the moment, uh, as soon as you become pregnant, your sexuality is kind of put aside. And yet it's the same energy. It's this incredible, powerful energy. Um, and I'm not talking about clitoral orgasm. I'm talking about everything else that arises from your, you know, from your sexual center. Yeah. Right up at the top, the spirituality, the ancestral line. So, um, and to me, this model offers uh, a really strong framework for then 
preparing women with the teachings of yoga so deeply and fully to face, you know, to face their shadows, uh, to hold their boundaries, the practices that we have for uh, enabling them to go inwards so that they can really uh, experience that liminal phase. Yeah. Uh, and hopefully uh, a physiological birth, if that's what they wish. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think it's about really being empowered, going in there with as many tools as you have so that you know that you can at least um, be in control of what you can be in control of. We know that we're not in control of anything, but at least feeling empowered to make some decisions for your body, for what you need for your birthing process um, and feeling that, you know, you you are not just a passive player, that there is a journey that you are engaged in through this process. And I think that um, that, that, is, that is really totally changing the, the paradigm for, for many, many women. Mm, mm, yeah. Anything you wanna end with? Um, well, if anyone is uh, interested in uh, uh, finding out more about this course that I'm running, I, I'm running an introductory workshop next Sunday. So Sunday, the 6th of Feb at nine o'clock and you can book that as a standalone and uh, um, uh, see- I think we're gonna put the link, you'll put the link for that in the Yoga Teachers Forum underneath this live. Yeah, definitely I will. So you can follow, follow through there. Um, and uh, yeah, well, as teachers, birth educators, if there's any mothers on this call, you know, it's ultimately, we've got to take responsibility for ourselves, whether we're a mother, uh, moving into it, whether you're a teacher, holding that space, you know, when it, pragmatic or uh, deeply yoga, taking responsibility for what we can do in the community is important. Yeah, I love that. Yeah, I love that. Um, amazing. I will just mention that I also am doing um, a four part workshop in March, slightly different, not about pregnancy and birth, obviously about um, women's hormonal health. Mm -hmm. It will include a section about fertility and the fertility journey and understanding as yoga teachers what um, people go through on their journey to become pregnant if it is not a spontaneous natural pregnancy um, and also looking at um, other women's health um, uh, pathologies, uh, PCOS, polycystic ovaries and endometriosis from um, a yoga teacher perspective. Um, I will put that detail, um, those details in the comments also. Um, Nadia, this has been beyond fascinating. Um, as I said, my journey into this whole world began after I had given birth to all my children. So my pregnancies were very conventional and only afterwards was I um, awakened to this um, alternative way of viewing the pregnancy and birthing process. And as I said, you know, being engaged and connected to my body. Um, and I know that you feel like I do, that we wanna pass these messages on to women before they have their kids so that they don't look back, you know, retroactively and say, hmm, I wish I would have known that then. So as you said, you know, even if you have had a birth before, your subsequent births can be different. And if you are supporting women in their birthing journey, then Nadia's course really is the one to do um, to, to give you the language and the tools to support women on their journey. So thank you for all of this fascinating conversation today. Thank you too, Jackie, I've loved it. <laughs> I'm going to stop our recording and I take us off live stream. So bye everyone.